yourself down. My name is Jennifer Bill. I'm one of the faculty members here in the School of Urban Studies and Planning. Uh, it's myself and Rob Bertini that help organize this seminar. So welcome all of you in the room and those of you out on the web. I am temporarily having some difficulty connecting to the network, so if you're going to email in a question and it doesn't get answered, that means I didn't connect and I apologize. Um, I'm going to introduce our speakers today. We have Scott Drum from the Port of Portland and we have Dick Walker from Metro and I, they're going to be talking about freight. And it's right up here on the screen so without further ado I'm going to hand it over to them. Ready? Okay. Thank you for inviting us to speak today. Dick and I always jump at the opportunity to talk about why we need to worry about freight movement here in the Portland, Vancouver area. While a small percentage of total traffic here in the region, freight is still very important and is a very important part of our regional economy, and that's why we're concerned with it. The Port and Metro have worked together for, well, I guess, about eight years now on freight issues. Uh, we started by trying to figure out what was being done in other regions and found there really wasn't much being done. Uh, so then we went to talk with local carriers and local shippers about their operations, learn what some of the barriers were to moving their freight around the region, and try to learn more about what those impacts were of the barriers on their operations. Now, as I mentioned, not much had been done in the area of freight, but we needed to know uh, how trucks were moving on the transportation system, so we had to develop our own method of, of looking at this. And what we ended up doing was coming up with a forecast of commodity flows and basing a truck travel forecasting tool on that forecast. It's a fairly unique approach. Nothing like this had been done before. And when we got done, it actually received quite a bit of national acclaim. Metro, as many of you may know, has a stellar reputation for modeling transportation. And this truck model actually just made their stock go even higher. So it's, it's a leading edge sort of thing. Another example of how Portland is sort of out in front of uh, in many planning issues. But freight is not just a local issue either. Uh, ODOT is paying quite a bit of attention to freight. Uh, in fact, they have a freight element as part of their statewide transportation and land use modeling project uh, and, have done, and have undertaken a number of studies to better understand freight needs around the state of Oregon. And then within the last decade or so, the federal government has also become quite interested in freight, having passed two uh, pieces of legislation which put together quite a bit of money for transportation infrastructure improvement projects and directed federal government agencies to do more research and data collection uh, in regards to freight movement. So what Dick and I are going to talk about today is how this region takes care of freight in the transportation planning process. And we do that using two key tools, the first being the commodity flow forecast and the second being the truck model. Before I go into detail on the commodity flow forecast, I want to bring you up to speed on why we should pay attention to freight. And again, the reason is it's important to our regional economy. The purpose of moving freight is to move goods from their point of origin to a point of higher value. Uh, this supports your regional manufacturing base, but 
perhaps more importantly to each of us as individuals, it allows goods to be put on store shelves so that we, as consumers, can go into any store any time and buy anything we want, whenever, whatever color, whatever shape, uh, that product is going to be there. And an entire industry has grown up around the movement of freight. And in fact, for the Portland-Vancouver area, it's one of our niches, it's one of our strengths. If you look at the map over here on the right side of the screen, you'll notice that in the Mississippi Valley and East Coast, distribution hubs are a dime a dozen. But if you look on the Pacific Coast, there really are only four centers of <coughs> distribution and logistics. We are one of them. That's true for a number of reasons. reasons. The first is geography. Geography has been very kind to the Portland-Vancouver area. We're actually closer to most of the domestic market than the Puget Sound region is. For example, our overnight truck reach, we can get all the way up to Vancouver, BC, and all the way down to the Bay Area, overnight truck delivery. You can't do that from Seattle or Tacoma. That's an advantage for local companies. Our rail connections are also an advantage. The only mainline Union Pacific service to Puget Sound from the interior of the United States is through the Portland, Vancouver area. Uh, on that same line of thought, the Columbia River Gorge is the only place in the Pacific Northwest where you have uh, dual lines of railroad service. Both the Union Pacific and the Burlington Northern Santa Fe have dual tracks on both sides of the river so that you don't have as much congestion as you would if you only had one line. That's an advantage for our region. The other thing about the gorge is that it provides the only east-west river grade level rail and highway corridor north of the Mojave Desert here on the west coast. If you think about trying to move into Seattle or the Bay Area, within your final 100 to 200 miles you've got to cross either the Cascades or the Sierra Nevada. Here we have a break in the Cascades and can come straight through, which makes delivery faster, less expensive, and more efficient. So again, another advantage for local companies. One of our other assets is our multimodal transportation system here in the region. This is one of probably two places on the West Coast, and certainly the only place in the Northwest, where you have interstate freeways, two transcontinental railroads, ocean shipping, inland barging, and international air freighter service all converging. And this generates economic activity for the region. In other words, we handle freight for others, and we get paid to do that. So for example, for every jacket uh, Columbia Sportswear sells, say, in Denver or Minneapolis or wherever, a part of that comes back to the region in form of salaries, payments to vendors, taxes, that sort of thing. So it generates economic activity. And some recent work that the Portland Development Commission has done for their economic development plan showed that about one in every ten jobs in this region uh, is in the transportation and distribution industry. And statewide, about 60% of all jobs are in sectors of the economy related to or very dependent upon freight movement. Next. As I've said, transportation is very important to the economy and it's becoming even more important. A recent study by Penn State University pointed out that logistics and transportation account for about 20 to 25% of a product's cost. And with the creation of just-on-time and just-in-time delivery processes and a rapidly improving transportation system, we've seen average delivery time for freight drop uh, dramatically in the past 40 years. What used to take 30 days in the 1960s only took 10 days in the 80s. Now we're talking two to three days. And again, that's an average, so there's a lot of freight out there that's actually moving faster than that. Now, to make this more concrete, this is an example of a local company that relies very heavily on the region's freight transportation system. It's Columbia Sportswear. First, I'm going to talk about their inbound movement. Columbia Sportswear is a major importer of apparel, footwear, and accessories from Asia. They bring most of those containers into the port of Portland's Terminal 6, where they are trucked down the road, probably maybe half a mile, to their regional, or actually their national distribution center in Rivergate. They also do some importing through the ports of Seattle and Tacoma, and that gets trucked down to Portland as well. For certain commodities and to meet certain deadlines, they will also use air freight, though not as much as ocean. And that comes in through Portland International Airport, but also through Seattle-Tacoma. And freight coming in from those airports also gets trucked then into the Rivergate Distribution Center. The next step, once it gets inside the warehouse, the ocean containers are unstuffed, the air freight is unpacked, and those products are sorted and stored by storekeeping units or SKUs. Once they have all the SKUs for a particular customer's order, they prepare that shipment for delivery. And delivery terms are typically, at least for Columbia Sportswear, dictated by their customers. They're told what mode, where to ship it, when to ship it. 
So once they've, they've got the instructions from their customer, they'll prepare it for either a truck or an air shipment. And just as an aside, the other thing they do in Rivergate is handle all the return product as well. So they have trucks coming back in uh, with return product. Some of their freight, though not all, that goes through this third step, which is called reloading. On the air side, freight forwarders come to the distribution center in Rivergate with a truck, pick up the freight, and take it to a reload center where it is prepared for final shipment um, on an airplane. It also happens on the truck side. A portion of what they move by truck is carried by less than truckload carriers. These carriers will come out to Rivergate to their facility, pick up the freight, and take it to the local hub here in Portland. There, they'll combine it with other loads from other shippers heading to the same set of cities. So in other words, Columbia Sportswear doesn't have to fill up an entire truck. They can split it with other companies all headed to you know, Atlanta or Memphis or wherever that particular truck is headed. Okay. And finally, they ship their product out of the region. <coughs> Excuse me. All three product lines, apparel, footwear, and accessories, move either by truck or by air. On the air cargo side, almost all of it is shipped on what are called integrated carriers. And these are the carriers that provide seamless door-to-door -door service, FedEx, UPS, Emory, those types of carriers. As I mentioned, on, on the truck side, they have LTL shipping less than truckload. And once it's been consolidated, it moves out through those companies' spoken hub systems across the country to the final destination. But the other option for truck service is full truckload. And that's when they have uh, a big enough order from a customer that it can fill a truck in and of itself. So in that case, it skips this third step of reloading and moves directly out of the region. The carrier will come right to Rivergate, fill the truck, and then head directly to their customer's distribution center or retail outlet. So that's an example of how a company relies on the freight transportation system here in the region. So what happened? Question. Sorry, do they know beforehand like um, what cities will get their um, goods by truck or by air or what that percentage breakdown is? They typically do because the customers typically give them the instructions before the merchandise actually gets into their Columbia Sportswear warehouse so that everything is ready to go as soon as all the SKUs arrive. So they'll know and have, have an idea of what the mix is. Just a comment on that. With, with e-business, uh, if you see the, 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 the tags that are scanned, they have automatic ordering systems now, so, so it's automated. Uh, if they order a Columbia, if they sell a Columbia Sportswear uh, piece of apparel in Atlanta, that goes into an order, it's auto automatic. Yes. What is a SKU? It's a storekeeping unit, and it sort of arose out of the barcoding that they now use in distribution, where each individual item has its own little barcode and own little number, and that's how they're, they're sorted and stored. So what happens if the system fails? Well, obviously, that's a very, very bad thing, because businesses are very dependent on the system functioning as it's designed to function. If it doesn't, if there's some delay or congestion, then that will change how they operate and how they do business. It might mean, for example, uh, cutting off production time earlier in the day so that they can meet some sort of transportation or delivery deadline. It may mean that they put extra trucks on the road because their existing fleet can't cover the same amount of territory as it used to. And something that no one wants to see, sometimes the carriers revert to using neighborhood streets to lessen the impact of delays caused by choke points. But perhaps even more important than the congestion and the delay is the uncertainty that it creates. Uh, from talking with our customers, we understand that they can, for a limited amount, deal with congestion and delays. The problem for them is knowing exactly when's the delay going to crop up and how long is it going to be. For example, let's imagine you're uh, a high-tech company out in Washington County. You really don't know today if it's going to take you 40 minutes, 50 minutes, 80 minutes to get to the airport. It just depends on what traffic conditions are like on US 26 and I-84. And that's a problem, um, mainly because today many customers have imposed delivery penalties for their vendors and carriers. So there's a missed delivery. Um, it will cost somebody in the supply chain um, some amount of money. It can range from something being relatively minimal, like having the truck have to wait till the next available truck bay is open. In other words, the truck waits 15 minutes, couple of hours, half a day, whatever it is, all the way up to very stiff financial penalties for a missed delivery. So being able to rely on the system to get their freight where it needs to go on time um, has financial consequences for them. 
And if these adjustments and these penalties are such that it raises their cost of doing business and makes them less competitive by being here, they may opt to leave the region. So again, another reason we need to pay attention to freight movement here. Now, Columbia was an example of how one company uses many modes to move its products. This table shows you a variety of commodities and the modes they use. The one thing they all have in common is that no single commodity here relies on just one mode to move. They need multiple modes. The other point I want to make about this slide is that there's been a trend recently in logistics where companies really aren't as concerned about what mode they used, but are more concerned with how fast can it get there and does it meet my transportation budget. So what they'll do is they'll turn to their carriers or their third-party logistics providers and say, hey, we need to get this shipment to Dallas in X number of days, and your budget is Y dollars. If you can do that in a truck, fine. If it takes an airplane, fine. If it, it doesn't really matter to them. Now, clearly, in certain circumstances, there are no options. They have to choose a particular mode. Or in certain circumstances, they prefer a mode for various reasons. But it's becoming more and more common for them to say, here are our constraints. You deal with it. You solve the problem. So again, another need for a multimodal transportation system. So having said that, why should we forecast commodities? Well, before we started doing this, regional decision makers really had only anecdotal, ne anecdotal data about the needs of freight. They really didn't have any hard evidence of what, what was causing <coughs> freight um, problems in the region. This database that we've developed because of the forecast gives them an idea of how much of which commodities are moving on which modes in the region. And in turn, what that does, it allows them to see why it's important to have access to all these modes and how the, all the modes are interrelated. But the main reason we did this is because that's what feeds the truck model. That's the data the truck model uses uh, to model traf truck traffic here in the region. So why do we care about truck behavior? Well. The truck model can do a couple of things. First of all, it takes our commodity flow forecast and takes it to the next level. The commodity flow forecast tells us what's moving and how much. The truck model can help tell us where. It can also help predict the future, so we can see today where choke points are going to be tomorrow. We then can evaluate various solutions and see how they'll address those problems, and then help us sort the projects by priority. So it's a very beneficial planning tool. And as I mentioned earlier, the federal government in the past 10 years or so has become very interested in freight, and they've made a lot of money available for transportation improvement projects. We then compete with other states, other regions, other metro areas for this money. What the model does for us is give us fairly definitive information about what our needs are, and we can make a better case for that money than other regions who don't have this kind of resource are able to do. Well, if Metro has a passenger vehicle model, why not just use that? Why do we need a model separate for trucks? And the answer is that passenger vehicle movement is typically much simpler than truck movement. If you think about a typical trip in your car, it's home, work, home, home, school, home. Maybe it's home, work, store, home. Uh, but it's out, typically out and back and fairly limited in scope. This diagram here is fairly simplified, but it shows you some of the forking that can happen with a truck. Um, it can go to a number of different places depending on the commodity, depending on, on what mode it's trying to link up with. So we need something that helps us really understand the unique uh, behavioral aspects of trucks. And that's what this model does for us. We have just recently completed an update of our commodity flow forecast. And this time around, we had two very distinct forecasts, but were part of the same project because they're related. The first was an update of, of the commodity flow forecast, how much of what is moving through the region on which modes. The other was to develop a forecast of waterborne cargo volumes in the lower Columbia River from the Portland-Vancouver harbors down to the mouth. What we're talking about today is the first point, the commodity flow forecast. It was a cooperative bi-state project sponsored by Metro, the Oregon Department of Transportation, the Port of Vancouver, the Southwest Washington Regional Transportation Council, and managed on the region's behalf by the Port of Portland which was the first time we've had that much cooperation on both sides of the river, so that was a very good thing. What we did is we established a baseline in 1997 for freight volumes here in the region and forecast them out to 2010, 2020, <coughs> and 2030. The data tells us information about the tonnage and the dollar value of freight moving to, from, within, and through our region. It gives us breakouts on market and direction of travel. 
It also is including an analysis on what trends and factors might influence any kind of mode shift or change in our commodity mix in the future. And what's very important for the model is it's also going to tell us some, in, some new information about truckload factors, uh, one of the key elements of the truck model. My point in showing you this slide is not to make you well versed in the sources of freight data, uh, but rather to, to point out that not one single data set exists that allows you to do this kind of work. And this is a list of only some of the data sources that were cobbled together for, for this project. I think it also probably indicates some of the complexity involved and some of the challenges and headaches that our consulting team faced. Fortunately, they did it. I didn't have to. Because that, that is a challenge. Next slide. When everything was said and done, what it told us was <clears throat> that freight volumes in the region were going to double by 2030. And this is a rate of growth that's a little bit bigger than national average, but a little bit slower than the West Coast as a whole. And I'd say it's slower than the West Coast as a whole, probably because of the phenomenal amount of growth forecast for Southern California, and they're driving up the, the average for the West Coast. But again, bigger than the nation as a whole. <clears throat> Next slide. This chart shows the largest commodities in the region on a tonnage basis. Eight commodity categories comprise about three quarters of all the tonnage, and we looked at 42 different commodity categories. And it's probably no surprise that the bulks are the leaders here, with petroleum products, non-metallic minerals, and cereal grains being the three largest. <clears throat> Looking ahead to the future, the forecast shows which commodities are going to grow fastest between now and 2030. The column on the far right shows which modes will be impacted by this growth. These two categories right here in green are highlighted because not only are they on this list of fastest growing commodities, but they were also in the previous chart of our largest commodities. So foodstuffs and non-metallic minerals are very big and they're growing very rapidly. The rest of this list is primarily high-value manufacturers, which has some implications for the regional air cargo industry. Next slide. And this slide talks about value. About 10 commodities comprise three-quarters of all value here in the region. Uh, you'll notice some of them were on the previous slide of our larger, uh, largest commodities in terms of tonnage, our cereal grains and petroleum, and that is just because of their sheer volume. Their dollar, va dollar per ton value is relatively low, but again, because there's so much of it being shipped through here, it shows up high in terms of total value. The rest of the list is much of what we might expect in that it's high value manufactured items that move by air. And this is an important point because if you only look at your commodities in terms of tonnage, air isn't even a blip on the radar screen. And our last round in doing this consulting team said, well, gee, air cargo is so small compared to everything else, do we really have to worry about it? And we said yes for this very reason because these are the high value products in our economy and it has a very big impact if we can't get them to the air cargo facilities when they need to get there. Here we have a comparison of the modes today versus 2030. Uh, really not much of a change. The one thing I do want you to take away from this slide is you look at truck and people kind of shudder saying, gee, that's a lot of trucks. It is. Trucks are the predominant mode for carrying freight. But understand that part of this comes from the fact that it ties other modes together and other transportation facilities together. For example, none of the air cargo in this region is generated at the airport. None of it's consumed at the airport. So all of it moves to and from the airport on a truck. If you look at ocean, yes, there are some places on the Columbia and Willamette Rivers here that do generate and consume their own cargo. But much more needs to be hauled away from marine terminals, again, using a truck. Intermodal activity, by definition, involves a truck move. And while some companies have rail sidings on their property, many, many more are reliant on the intermodal ramps around the region to access rail transportation. Again, trucks are what link them. So while trucks are huge, uh, we really do rely on them to move freight. Yes? It is captured, so there's some double counting going on. Intermodal is specific because it's billed as one move truck rail. It's its own sort of modal category. So that, that truck is not going to be included here, but the others will. Yes. And is the reason that, say, like uh, ocean and barge are decreasing, I mean, does that have to do, is that a cost issue? Because it would seem that, especially with congestion and other other 
concerns that uh, that truck percentages might have to stay, you know, the same or you know not too much greater than they are now. Actually, for the for for this particular forecast, it's more a function of the volumes of commodities that move by those modes, and so those are some of the slower growing commodities. Yes. Did this forecast include uh, where gas? Did this forecast include where gas um, consumption for the world is going to be? Um, no, because we are not a producer, just a consumer. The only petroleum that was tracked here was petroleum that was moved through the region, distributed, then around the Pacific Northwest. So <clears throat> for, for our regional purposes, that's all we needed to, to talk about. Next slide. So truck is our largest volume of, moves our largest volume of freight, and it's one of our fastest growing. Uh, the next slide factors out trucks so you can see more of what's happening with the other modes. Uh, it may not look like it, but air cargo down here is predicted to be the fastest growing mode over the next 30 years. But again, it's also on a smaller base. I also want to point out this green line, which is pipeline. You'll notice there's a big dip here in 2000, and that's because of the explosion that occurred in the, uh, the Olympic pipeline up in northwest Washington. That pipeline is how a large portion of the petroleum products moving to this region <coughs> are shipped. With that pipeline out of commission, we had to find a different mode to move that product. Fortunately, we had capacity in our barge system, and that product was barged down. So. The point I want to make is, by having a multimodal transportation system, we still got the petroleum product that we needed when we needed it. Had that not been there, the only two options would have been rail or truck. And if you think about petroleum, it's fairly bulky, <laughs> fairly heavy. Think about the number of rail cars it would have taken, the number of trucks it would have taken, and what that would have meant for congestion uh, on the rail and freeway network in the I-5 corridor. Further, uh, aside from pipeline, waterborne is probably the least cost mo method of moving freight. So if we'd had to use rail or truck, we might have seen an increase in petroleum-based product costs here in the region because it would have cost more to serve the region. So again, having a multimodal freight system um, is to our advantage. Next slide. One thing we did with this particular forecast that we were not able to do before is take a look at pass-through traffic. And what pass-through traffic is is that freight that moves through the region but is n never stops to get handled. In other words, it's something moving from Southern California to Puget Sound, from British Columbia to the San Francisco Bay Area, never gets handled here in Portland at all. It represents about 15% uh, of, of freight volumes overall in the region. For trucks, it's about 7%, but for rail, it's 41%. If you think back to about what I said earlier about the gorge being a funnel for rail activity, that's why this number is so high. Much of this is heading to Puget Sound. Now, some people argue that, well, that's not necessarily a good thing because having all that traffic for Seattle and Tacoma congests our rail network. It does to a certain extent. But the, the beauty of it is we have a level of service and investment in infrastructure from the railroads themselves that you wouldn't see in a market our size otherwise because we handle this freight. So local companies are able to avail themselves of better service and better infrastructure uh, because of it. So it, 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 it does congest, but I think it also has benefits. Next slide. So what does all this mean? Well, clearly there's increased demand nationally, locally, and even globally for some of the products that we produce and, and handle here in the region. And that's going to mean increased freight volumes. As we put increased freight on the roads, rivers, rails, and airplanes, it's going to put additional pressure on our transportation system. So we need to make sure that what we're doing when we do transportation planning is make sure that we have an efficient system for all modes to operate. Because if they don't, they'll start to use other modes. And truck tends to be the default mode for a lot of freight. Now I showed with petroleum an, ex uh, an exception to that where barging was actually the alternative mode. Um, but if we put more and more pressure on the road network, um, it's only going to make matters worse. And I'll turn it over to Dick to talk about how we know what's moving and where it's moving on the road system. Thank you, Scott. What, um, what I'd like to point out here is just to kind of bring things, uh, refocus a little bit. Scott pointed out earlier in his conversation with you that we've got two things going on here. First was the establishment of a commodity flow database. 
Now we're going to change the focus a little bit and how have we used that database to create a simulation tool for freight. What my intent here is not to go into a lot of detail with this, but I want to give you just a, an overview. Okay? You will not be freight modelers when we're done, but I hope you have an appreciation of the kind of consideration and the factors that go into the development of this tool. Okay, let's take a look at some of the features of this model. What I'm going to do is you know, just walk you quickly through these features and then we'll go back and talk in a little bit more detail on various aspects of them. First of all, this tool is a commodity-based flow um, simulation tool. And if you'll note there, we have that number 42. There are 42 unique commodities that are being addressed in this database. That is uh, a great, uh, that, that's very important because commodities, when you transport different commodities, they have different kind of characteristics. We'll talk more about that later. We, ha we look at different truck types in this model. Uh, we are focused for this tool, medium trucks, which are the two axle, six tire, and then the more heavy trucks, which is representative of a cabin trailer, something like that. I want to emphasize we are not focusing or addressing all the different kind of commercial vehicles that are out there. We're not talking about the Flores, the, uh, the plumbers, you know, those kind of things. This is more of the major movements. We, um, we have unique load factors that are going on in this model. That's a little bit, that's pretty unique too when you compare models from different regions. Uh, depending upon the commodity, depending upon the type of vehicle being used, you are going to have a different amount of trucks resulting from that. And the last point there, um, when we actually put these, once you get through quantifying the number of trucks and putting them onto the road system, we uh, simulate them using passenger car equivalents. In other words, if you look at a highway capacity manual, for example, a given truck, on average, is worth about two and a half cars. It's higher than that if you're talking about a situation where you're going up a grade, like the Sunset Hill, for example. Uh, that's important because it certainly has great impacts on the amount of capacity that is used in the system and the degree of congestion that could result because of that. So these are some of the unique features we have in a model that we, want, that we felt were important enough to capture. Okay, commodity-based. I know you're hearing that word over and over and over again, commodity. Uh, so important. When you look at the number of truck trips that are driven in the system, it's not by employment. You could have a firm that would have 10, 20 employees generate a whole lot more truck trips than a firm of 100. It really depends upon the type of the business, the type of the goods that they either consume or produce. Commodity is the key there. That generates how many trips we're talking about. Furthermore, the type of commodity you are dealing with has a huge influence on the transport characteristics that you see. We have a few of those listed here. Um, the type of vehicle, to say the obvious, um, is influenced by the commodity. If you're hauling logs, you need a pretty big rig. If you're hauling high-tech equipment, it could be a van. Okay. Load factors, um, heavy commodities do not, aren't able to load as many in a given vehicle. Uh, time of day, some commodities that are very high value, very time dependent, they don't have much flexibility in their delivery times. Whereas other goods have that flexibility and can be done at night. So you see different kind of reactionary modes to uh, the various stimuli that can be brought into the system. Next slide. Um, commodity influence certain kind of characteristics along the transport route. Uh, through the examples that Scott gave, you can see some goods require reloading or consolidating or restuffing, whichever term terminology you like to use there. Um, you need to account for that in the transport system, otherwise you're missing out an important leg, if you will, of the trip. Finally, uh, why are commodities so important? You need to have a modeling system that 
is sensitive to change in the future. If for some reason you have you had a big change of the commodity mix from your from the current system to your 2020 or 2030, different transport characteristics could arise. Uh, if you have more electronic and less of a different kind of a good, you're going to see different time of day characteristics, different truck requirements. You need to have a simulation tool that's sensitive to that. Next, please. Okay. Um, I want to, in these next two or three slides, talk about the logic of the system. This is just a quick walkthrough. Subsequent slides will give you a little bit more detail on different ways of looking at it. Okay, picture in your mind uh, this commodity database that Scott has talked about. A big spreadsheet, all the commodities are listed, all sorts of market segmentation pieces going on. We'll talk more about that in a second. But what we're able to do is link the commodity flows into different points of entry around the region. Some may be by car, or sorry, by truck on I-84. Some may be at the um, PDX. Some may be at Terminal 6 along the Columbia River. You know, depending upon the commodity, there's different kinds of points of entry that might be, um, that it might be associated with. Once we get to that point, we're able to uh, take a look at this commodity and assess <laughs> if there's any kind of a reload requirement. Some goods go directly to the consumers, some do this reload. So you can see what I'm setting the stage for here is we have a tool that's, that's um, sort of a rule-based model. Okay, If any of you are familiar with uh, passenger transport models, there's lots of logit equations, things like this. This is a different form. This is much more of a rule-based, categorical type model. Okay, next point down. Once you make those first two assessments, you go through a process where you estimate uh, logical destinations for this load. I'm going to go into that more in a little bit. Okay, given that, you need to convert this uh, commodity tonnage into how many trucks are required. Okay, and that takes into account the type of commodity, the type of truck used, all those kind of things. You need to bring empty trucks into the system because there's backhauls, there's repositioning of fleets, things like that that are going on. Then finally, we are able to take this uh, grand conglomerate of trucks, okay, and put them onto a computerized simulation network to get flows. Yeah. How are commodities that are produced within the region treated? Okay, that's a good point. Uh, admittedly, in my description here, I've kind of painted it from the picture of the outside in, but I could just as well go through this conversation and do it inside out. It's sort of a reciprocal thing. So yes, they're accounted for too. So that's just, that's just a real quick thumbnail sketch of the concept of what we're trying to do. Okay. Now we go into a little more of a detailed schematic. Uh, this is a huge exercise of working with the database, okay? Because there is lots and lots of market segmentation that's going on. Um, when you look at the step one, two, three points, uh, you can see you have, if you can visualize in your mind how this might work, you have a database. Um, Scott, help me out here. Is it an access database or just a spreadsheet or? Um, not that it's well, critical, it's but, Excel, but anyway, you get the idea. You're in a database manager of some sort and um, stratifying all this information. So we're going through. What we're trying to do now from the beginning to the end is take this commodity database, do some manipulation with it, and create a truck trip table for assignment to a simulation network. That's what we're trying to do. So you stratify this uh, commodity database table into uh, the type of commodity it is, different market segmentations, the arrival modes, okay? So we're doing all this slicing. And then from there, we, move over to, we go over to this middle step, step four, five, and six. Uh, what you do then is for each of the, for a particular um, cell in the segmentation process, that process that's going on, that has gone on, excuse me, um, 
you have to designate an arrival facility. So, for example, that's going to depend upon the type of commodity. Um, uh, if you're looking at something that's arriving by truck, for example, that's coming from the north, the database is telling us that. For simulation purposes, the, the obvious entry point for that type of good would be I-5 North. If it's coming by um, air, the obvious arrival point is PDX. So you kind of work your way through that. It's just sort of a, use some good judgment here as what logical entry points or exit points <laughs> would be. All right, so you make that determination. Um, and then as I talked before, given an arrival location, you have to go through and find a destination. Okay, how does that work? Well, what we try to do is link the commodity type, or given a certain commodity type, there are certain places where it would be more likely to go. Okay? And you can do that by a number of different ways. You can look at employment type. See, we're on the second generation of this freight model. The first uh, generation went through a process where we um, based it upon employment type, looking at SIC categories, okay? Trying to link that SIC category of employment with the type of commodity. Now, unfortunately, that linkage isn't black and white. It's, it's not clear, okay? There's some professional judgment that's used, but the attempt was made to try to link those. With the second generation, what we're doing is um, using data produced by, by ODOT and some work they've done with the statewide model to use a input and consumption matrix that's been produced, an I.O. table. So you can, by, you can look at the producers of goods, the consumption of goods, and there's different indices that are uh, indicate the degree of correlation between them. And we can use that as a proportionality uh, fit, if you will, as to the likelihood of where a particular good would go. Um, so destination, could, would that be somewhere w just within this region, or is that like Seattle or Minneapolis? Yeah. Or? For simplicity, it kind of your point is the same as uh, what Jim raised here. For simplicity, I'm kind of describing it as outside coming in. But the exact inverse is also true. We have goods produced in this region. Like your, your um, arrival facility... <laughs> Maybe rival isn't exactly the right word. It should be more of the uh, place where we account for it in the system. It could just as well be um, a Nike, all right? It's produced. It's distributed out to uh, whatever their typical uh, transport system is, and then from there it leaves, okay? Or it could be an electronic good. So we account for things produced here going out, things produced elsewhere going in, coming in. Both of those are accounted for. It's just for simplicity I'm describing out to in. I'm sorry, I guess my, I think my question was just simpler than that. It oh. is, um, since this is a model for this region, you're just looking at arrivals and destinations within this region, whether or not the final destination is somewhere else? We're focused on those that have a trip in, if you want to call it that, in this region. However, you can't ignore the through trips. As Scott indicated, 15% or so of the tonnage is coming through this region. And you have to have that, those trucks on the system as well, otherwise you're missing some of the, the flow movements. Uh, you just answered my question about the through trips. Thanks. Okay. Do you account for internal circulation that is from plants in Beaverton to Portland and vice versa? Yes, sir. That's accounted for here, too, as well. Yes? Uh, okay, let's walk through an example. Um, let's say a good arrives in the region at T6 on a container, in a container through barge or ship or however it might arrive. Okay? Um, let's say it's something Fred Meyer has. Okay? It's some, some products and goods that Fred Meyer has ordered for this region. So, hypothetically, that good 
might need to go to some kind of a reload slash distribution center. So maybe that good is transported then by truck down to uh, the Clackamas area, the Clackamas distribution center. Okay. From that site, the goods have to be distributed out to the respective stores that need this product. So maybe one, so maybe there'd be a truck that's headed to Beaverton, one to Gresham, one to name your site. So that's kind of the, the segmentation to needs to be going on. Or one to Seattle. You bet. All potential destinations. Okay. Yes. Are there efforts to have those places, the distribution centers, closer to where the oh, sorry, closer to where the goods come in, so they don't have to be shipped as far before they're reloaded? Or do you know anything about those siting decisions? Or? I don't. Okay. Scott, are you better able to address or? <laughs> there we go. We'll try this. Uh, yeah, actually, companies do like to have their distribution facilities close to the transportation and the reload facilities so that they're not moved as much prior to final outbound shipment. And so you'll see, that's why you see the, those four areas on the west coast I showed in that one map. That's why they're as dark green as they were is because they want, those companies want to be close to both the transportation facilities and the reload facilities. Thanks, Scott. Okay, so here we are in this middle stuff slice, and we basically defined origin destination movements for the commodities. Next step, in step seven, uh, create vehicle or truck trips from those commodities. And again, you apply different <coughs> kinds of load factors depending upon the commodity uh, and the type of carrier. Step eight, account for some backhaul or empties. And then step nine, we've created a vehicle trip table that we can use for assignment purposes. You may come to find, to regard this as the slide from Hack at some point. <laughs> but I, I, I have one I more know. question. On the, on the uh, truckload equivalents, do, do you differentiate between 80,000 pound trucks and extended weight trucks? Uh, at this point, we just have that medium and heavy. The, what you run into is you know, data, data, data. There's data limitations all over the place. The typical source you go to for uh, payloads of trucks is what's called the uh, TIAS and the VIAS database, uh, Vehicle in Use Survey, uh, Truck in Use Survey. That's a database that's created by the federal government through surveys that they do. And it's so hard. You know, they're focusing in that study much more on long haul versus short haul. So you can get average payloads, but is it really capturing the local work? So it's when you're looking at these secondary sources, you have to do a lot of, you do the best you can, but there's also some professional judgment going on. And I'm going to have a slide here that talks about future work we want to do, and I'll kind of address that a little more. OK. And you're right, this is a very nasty slide, but um, I realize some people, you know, we're all different, we all think in different ways. Some people like flows, some people think in more structure, but for those that want a more simpler <laughs> approach, let's look at the next slide. Okay, um, <laughs> that's really simple, that's right. Are, have I snowed you yet? Huh? Okay, <laughs> let's just go through a really quick example. All right, apparel. Okay, in this database, we have um, tonnage identified for apparel. And depending upon the good, there's different kinds of units that are used. In this particular case, case, apparel is measured in terms of tons. So in our little example, there's 100 tons of apparel that we're going to address. Okay? Now, of those 100 tons, um, they're coming from different places. Okay, you can see... The database is just very general, okay? It's hard to get specific origin destination data from uh, sources available, but just in a general sense. The north, meaning Seattle, Canada. The south being, uh, you know, Southern Oregon, California, Mexico. You get the idea, just general places like that. So if we follow through with our example, um, we see that 50 of it is coming from in international sources. 
Okay? Then we follow that through. Of the 50 tons that arrived in Portland from an international source, 15 tons of that is going to stay here in Portland. It's going to be delivered here. And you can see as you go across the, the row here, some of it is going to be leaving the region. You know, we're just a, uh, a hub, if you will. All right, and following that through, uh, what are the primary modes? Well, um, these, of the tons that are arriving internationally, they're going to stay in Portland. 10 tons of it arrived by ship, and smaller amounts by other modes. Okay? Then as we go further down, once you have that arrival, there's a truck component of the trip to get it to its final destination. So I hope this kind of illustrates the degree of complexity in this database. There's, it cascades down into a lot of different strata. Okay, next. Okay, we've gone through this process now of creating a truck trip table. So we're ready to do some analysis with it. Um, ultimately, we're looking to get truck flows on links, on roadway links in our simulation system. Okay? And because of the richness of this database, we're able to do uh, not only a richness, but the disaggregativeness okay, of this database. We're able to do some pretty uh, complex and unique things when you get down to analysis. For example, we didn't know we know more than just truck flows on links. We know what they are by comp commodity. Therefore, we can do some kind of value assessment. What is the cost of delay? That could vary by corridor, depending upon the kind of goods that are traveling through it. Um, what's the segmentation between heavy or medium trucks? That might have an influence on the type of, let's say you're in a congested corridor, that could influence the type of improvement you might want to do. Uh, commodity type, I've already said. Time periods. You know, flows during the nighttime aren't that big a deal, but if you start looking at flows that are during, you know, peak periods or midday periods, um, you have different effects during those different time periods of the day. We can do more things. Um, I just made a real rough, I didn't, I had help. <laughs> we just did a real rough uh, illustration here of how you can calculate information such as this. This represents the year 2020, the two hour PM peak, so that's four to six PM. Um, this is work we did for our regional transportation plan and to try to get a sense of the degree of uh, congestion or the effects that trucks were uh, bringing into the system. So if you look at I-84, for example, you can see that 3.5% uh, of the flow is uh, is, is trucks. The, probably the biggest number there is that represents a 75% increase over today. You walk around all these different quarters, you can see fairly significant numbers. I-5 North is a 24% increase. I-5 South, 50% increase. You know, those are big numbers. Next slide. Uh, how about VMT? Again, we look at the various corridors. Uh, probably the big story there is, let's look at I-84 again as an example. Auto VMT in that quarter is going to grow by 7%. Look at that truck VMT, 90% increase. Okay, You look at trucks, they don't have a lot of options when it comes to traveling. You know, They've got to go on the regional system pretty much. Cars tend to divert, find alternative routes, but a lot of trucks don't have that luxury. Next. Okay, given this tool, we have applied it in quite a few studies so far. I've listed three here, and it's getting more and more use all the time. It seems like anymore, over the last couple of years, we don't do any study at all that doesn't raise the question of trucks. Okay? It's either a truck-specific project, or if it's not, is the thing we're talking about going to impact trucks in some way? Okay? Because Freight is important, and as Scott has talked about in his presentation, um, you know the region's mind is really thinking about freight now. Okay, it's on everyone's mind. So uh, we've used this tool to help designate what the regional freight network should be in this region. Where should the focus be for uh, good freight movement? 
I mentioned it's in our RTP, and it's been used in I-5 Transportation and Trade Partnership. Uh, one project that I did not include there was the uh, Interstate Rail Project, uh, interstate, interstate Light Rail. That's a good example. That's not a freight project, okay? But for those that are familiar with the project, a lane on Interstate Avenue was taken away for the light rail. Trucks use that road too. Okay, so what happened? Okay, that's, that's how this tool is useful. Next, please. Okay, um, there's some caveats. You know, I, I, I hope I've kind of given you the flavor of what this tool, this model is like, and it can really do some nice things, but we don't want to get too overzealous about it because there are some data caveats involved here. Everything we've done so far due to funding limitation has been using secondary data. Uh, if you recall, Scott had a slide that looked at some of that secondary data. We use the peers, port, import, export record survey. Data from REBI, this is a group that produces national data, the TransSearch database. Uh, the National Commodity Flow Survey that the that has done nationally. They're all terrific data sources, but each and every one of them have some kind of limitation. None of them are perfect. The, and um, I'm not faulting the data collector there at all. I'm just saying it is extremely hard to get good freight data. So what you have to do is understand totally that this is just secondary data we're using and there are some little fallacies. Fallacies, I don't know if that's the right word, but there are, uh, you have to look at it for reasonableness, okay? Okay, um, vehicle classification counts. Uh, for those that are familiar with count system, um, it's very expensive to get good count data for trucks. So when you build this tool and create a simulation of flows on the system, you really need to check those flows against count data to see how well you're performing. Okay, we've done that at locations where we have good counts. HPMS, Highway Performance Monitoring System, provides you some locations where that's done. The Port of Portland, they have counts at a, some key locations. So we think we do a really good job on major facilities, major areas of high truck volumes. But we know for a fact that we're weak on the lower class facilities and places away from major truck sites, okay? Um, the counts are limited. You know, we can only have confidence in areas where we have counts. So this is really a place where um, attention needs to be placed in getting a good database of counts. Where are we going in the future? Um, as I mentioned, all this work we've done so far has been using secondary data source. We need to go in and start looking at some primary sources. So there's been proposals and there's, uh, I know John McConaughey here has been looking at things, the Regional Freight Committee has been looking at things, but regionally we're looking at different ways now to try to finance some type of origin destination survey for major trucks, the big trucks, okay, for this region to help better validate and define the truck movements. That will help us. Once we get that information, we can help make those uh, enhancements to our regular model as well. LTL, less than truck load delivery patterns. Uh, these are the type of trucks that are on little tours, if you will. They're dropping off goods, picking up goods, dropping off, picking up, picking up, and then returning back to their uh, site. We need to know more about that. What do those tours, what are average number of stops, what kind of uh, uh, market area do they work in? We need to know more about that. Um, I talked about the vehicle classification program. We need to establish a more regular program where we can get continuous data and establish, <coughs> excuse me, some historical history, if you will, some trends of how truck counts are going. Because right now it's pretty much hitting this. Uh, finally, we're working very closely with our uh, co compatriots down in Salem who are working on a statewide model, um, making sure that we share data, work together, work cooperatively, and make sure our two tools integrate. We only want one story coming out of these models. Okay, so uh, for a few closing words, I'll pass the mic again to Scott.
We've talked quite a bit about the commodity flow forecast and the truck model, uh, but uh, what I want to emphasize as sort of our final remarks um, is that really the value in what we've done has been that the region has used this. This wasn't something that we did because, gee, this looks really interesting, or you know, why don't we just try to do something. There was definitely a need in the region, and that's why we did this. It was used. So that's why I have this on the screen. No matter how cutting edge this is, really it's not worth much if we don't pay attention to what it says. So both Dick and I and, and the rest of us at the Port and Metro who work on, on this type of stuff really encourage you, uh, both students and practitioners, that as you go through your careers, um, encourage the development of tools like this and use them to make more informed decisions about freight. Have you had any assistance from uh, private trucking and other companies? And does their secrecy with their own data and freight models hinder your ability? create your own accurate model? Yes. Do you, do you want to <laughs> take that or do you want me to take that one? <clears throat> oh, go ahead. Okay. Um, we have tried uh, to work with local trucking companies and national trucking companies. And when we talk to them, sure, that's a great idea. We'll see what we can get you. And they come back and go, oh, you know, because of confidentiality agreements with our clients and a number of things, it just isn't possible for them. Um, but you're right. If we had that, it would really improve the accuracy of our model. Very perceptive. <laughs> Actually, I have a couple uh, questions from people watching us on the web. <laughs> and uh, one of them is, uh, is the modeling network able to take into account either short-term or long-term transportation system interruptions, such as a short-term tunnel closure or a long-term weight restrictions on bridges and routes? Okay, the way the model is currently structured and I'm not sure how we could do it any other way. It is not sensitive to any modal changes that might occur, okay? But it could be, a, it is sensitive to different kinds of routing decisions that might be made. Okay, so for example, if the Sunset Tunnel was closed, you would see diversion to um, you know, I-5 I South, 217, or whatever other options might be available. That's the best we could do at this point. You could, you could probably do some of that proscriptively, but as one of the users of the model, this, this is a time-consuming endeavor. It sometimes takes maybe uh, four to six weeks to get a model run out if you, if you are counting on setting it up and then running it, making sure that it, the results make sense and then reporting it back. So in terms of real time, no. <laughs> Yes, for example, if something happens in the morning and you want to know what's going on, what should we do about it in the afternoon, that's not practical. Okay, and the other question was, uh, what will the impact of the loss of consolidated freightways on shipping through the Port of Portland? Do you see another carrier filling their position? Well, that's, that's a good question. In terms of um, the port directly, um, not as much directly because they are not a drayage firm. In other words, not the kind of company that comes to the terminal to haul containers away. Um, but it definitely will impact uh, our customers and, and other shippers here in the region. Um, I know there's someone's looking at buying consolidated freightways, but I know there's a lot of concern as to whether or not anybody can make that work. I think with the economy as it is and with shipment volumes down overall, um, I think it's questionable. But that's just my personal opinion. seems I'm just looking at the databases you have here for the forecast models that you have it seems that you a lot of them seem to be from the you know of a trend forecast of what the economic activity has been but is there anything on the other side such as um, constraints on uh, financial constraints on the supply like for example um, metros plan for the region the RTP projects for example like on a financially constrained model in which there is no more building, then you have to do you adjust for those because they seem we're going to get twice as many trucks, but maybe that's not the case if we don't build certain things. That's a very good point. In fact, you you, you made the point. Um, it does not. It, it, the the forecast assumes enough infrastructure to handle that traffic. It's based on what we have today, what we've seen on the past, and so it's up to decision makers to decide, do we really want to be able to accommodate all of this traffic? And therefore then invest in facilities um, um, and infrastructure projects to be able to handle those. So they 
it, it is it takes into account what is the infrastructure, infrastructure that no it today. no it assumes that the infrastructure necessary will be there will so be there, we right? may make a decision we don't want to build a road or a highway or a link to a, an intermodal ramp um, and that would definitely impact the forecast and probably bring it down if it was not built right well, but which one I think metro has three one is like the pipe dream one is the uh, partially built and one is the uh, leave it as it is uh, so this would be closest to the the actually not even close to leave it as is. It just assumes that whatever decisions we made in the future will accommodate freight. So it doesn't take into account whether it's the financially constrained or any of them actually. It's sort of absent of decision about infrastructure investment. Yeah. Um, you said that it was an unusual situation with the commodity flow database, database development that you got the kind of by state and regional coordination cooperation that you did. Is that, you know, with like the I-5 trade partnership, I mean, is there an ongoing vehicle for that kind of bi-state cooperation, or is it just on a kind of a project development basis? Uh, no, the bi-state commission actually meets on a fairly regular basis to talk about, to, yeah, transportation, land use, and, and John might be able to answer that question better, actually. Uh, we, Clark County, I, I'm from Clark County, Washington Department of Transportation, and uh, we try to integrate our our transportation planning and have for some time. For example, uh, people from Clark County sit on the various committees and governing boards at Portland Metro and vice versa on, on the transportation planning boards. And as an outgrowth, uh, several years ago we developed uh, a, a, a bi-state uh, committee specifically for transportation planning and a recommendation coming from this I-5 partnership uh, uh, process which studied I-5 recommended even further integration planning to uh, with regard to land use and some other some other activities and we're in the process of putting that together. Um, and one of the slides that, uh, that you had in the presentation here for uh, modal shares of uh, Portland Vancouver regional tonnage uh, 97 versus 2030. How much of that is that um, on the ocean and barge side is affected by the channel deepening um, proposal on the Columbia and the Willamette? Most of the barge numbers um, probably would not be impacted by channel deepening one way or the other because they're very shallow draft vessels. Um, some of it is within the region here, but a lot of it is upriver to paper mills and um, grain elevators up the Columbian Snake River. So that shouldn't be impacted too much. Um, <clears throat> that is very similar to question to what this gentleman over here asked about the uh, metros financially constrained and other plans for the transportation network. Again, it assumes that there's some level of capacity out there um, to handle this. If, for example, the channel is not deepened, um, I would imagine these numbers would go down because it assumes that we have the capacity to handle at least some increase in vessel size to handle increased traffic. Um, and if it's the channel is deepened, it may go ab slightly above what's predicted here. So some of it, I would say, is, is at risk if the channel is not deepened. Um, you mentioned that 15% of the freight pass through the Portland metropolitan area, and you said something that there is some advantages and benefits to it. What is the advantages of freight that's moving through Portland? Uh, that was mainly on the rail side. It was on the rail side. Because we handle more volume than we, are, we ourselves produce or consume, we actually have better service, more frequent service, and better infrastructure because of the volume coming down from Puget Sound. And the railroads themselves are doing the investing in the infrastructure. If we didn't have that connection, if Seattle and Tacoma could just head directly east, uh, we wouldn't have that volume, and we probably wouldn't have the frequency of service or the investment in the rail lines that we have. So that, that's the advantage. Could you talk a, a bit about the assumptions or the modeling that connects commodities to modes in the region? Um, there's not a whole lot to say about that. What we relied upon were the, was the work of the consultants in guiding and with some of the mode shares. You know, this model does not go through a behavioral type approach to see how modes would shift um, through time 
because of congestion or channel deepening or you know name your favorite impact okay um, we used as a baseline the guidance that our consultant team gave us in terms of trends of how mode shares might change now we realize this is sort of a middle of the road approach okay but um, to construct a model that is indeed sensitive to those kind of things was like a whole um, level of magnitude above that. In terms of models, I'd say we've taken steps, if you take a look about eight years ago, we've taken steps one through five. For the long term, we need to go five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 12, <laughs> okay? There's still a lot more to be done. We've done a lot, but there's still more to be done. So at this point, we just use consultant guidance for that. But the way the database is constructed, it does provide the opportunity to do some what ifs. For example, a person could go in, modify the commodity database in some way in terms of uh, just do a manual mode shift, change your table, and then we could run it through our, uh, our freight model, if you will, and see what that kind of scenario came out in terms of flows. Do you want to add anything, Scott? Goods arrive in Portland through some mode, and then they're sh they're sent out another way. Are there a way local decision decision makers can affect how they're sent? If like encouraging rail and water rather than strictly truck and highway, you know, like I mean, you can you can say we're not going to build this new road, but can you encourage other modes? Locally? I think it would be hard um, because again. It depends on the quality of the service of the particular carriers involved. It depends on their schedules. It depends on the pricing. Some commodities only move on a couple of different modes simply because that's all they can afford. Or they move on certain modes because they have to because of time. So we might be able to try, but I'm not sure how successful we'd be because there are market forces at work that are probably beyond our control. This isn't specifically directed, you know, directed to your question, but just a thought came to my mind as you did ask that. When you do engage conversations with the trucking slash freight community, it's, it's so interesting because all of them are on a two-month, three-month kind of horizon or thought process. You try to engage a conversation about, well, we want to do some things that will affect the infrastructure five years from now, ten years from now. We want to make a 20-year transportation plan. What kind of roads do you need in place to help you do this? And you know, you're just coming from very different temporal places. They're thinking very short term, as they have to. Um, I wonder if Metro uses this forecast to in their land use model. UGB expansion, location of industrial land, zoning, you know, that type of thing? Uh, we are not using it in terms of industrial land. I mean, that's kind of a different process, how much land you need, those kind of things, all right? We are using it in terms of the degree of congestion that might be brought into the system due to truck movements. That part is accounted for. The part that is affecting accessibility between places and as accessibility to a place reduces, you know, it's less likely that a certain area might develop. So indirectly, it's a part of the equation. But I, I think what you're asking is, do we actually look at where the truck patterns are, the O and D patterns, and would it be more effective if this distribution center was moved up here? And the answer is no. Yeah, my question actually kind of follows on the heel of the uh, first question that was asked related to what is the participation level of the private uh, transportation companies here locally. Um, there, um, and, and, and also a comment that was just made about the, um, uh, the reaction that, that Metro uh, and the other folks that are working on this have received from those companies is... is being sh sort of short-sighted, um, I I work for a, a major LTL company um, whose uh, IT services are, are here in in Portland, Oregon. And in fact, I'm I'm, I'm fairly intimate with um, 
the uh, the system that we have in place for uh, dispatching our, our vehicles uh, throughout the U.S. And um, I, I think perhaps part of the problem um, is that the folks that may be representing these companies aren't necessarily intimate with the, 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 the process that happens at that level and therefore they, they, they can't make the connections. So I'm wondering if you could, if you could, would, could comment on that and is that, is that something that you guys have or, or you feel is, is the experience you've had in dealing with some of these companies here locally? I think that it is. I don't know if you agree, Dick, or not, but I know some of them, especially the local people, really want to help out and do what they can, but as they try to, to get permission from corporate headquarters or the data department or whomever, that's when they start having difficulty. So I think you're, maybe it's that we're not talking to the right set of people. Yeah, I'd like to add, early on in the process, we developed a various set of committees to kind of guide us as to what approach we should take what kind of tools would be best to be sensitive to the kind of policies and the questions f facing them. So one of the committees we developed uh, was indeed a uh, committee that had different kind of carriers, shippers, people like that on it. And we got great participation. We got Consolidated Freight, we got UPS, um, Scott helped me out on some of the others. Intel, um, Sequent, we, we had some of the, the bigger players in the region. So, you know, my hat's off to them because they're obviously very busy people with a business to run, but they did take the time out, come and talk to us. Uh, we met, you know, roughly monthly for a period of three, four, five, six months, you know, off and on for a whole year. So they really committed a lot of time to help. But, um, and, and during that process, you know, we did our best to try to discuss the planning process, <laughs> if you will, but it's, it, it's difficult. So I, you know, they did tell us good things, and they did help us uh, guide us into the directions the models should take. Um, but you know, we we are suffering a little bit of shortfall when you come down to the next step in terms of could we get some delivery data, for example, to see exactly what kind of patterns you make, because um, you do run into confidentiality and things like that. And secondly. Even if you do find a firm that's willing to contribute data to this effort, um, it seems like every firm you visit has a different kind of format for their data. Some have it electronic, some have a, a file cabinet, some have it just sheets on the desk. It's all over the board. So I think you can appreciate to try to process, process that data and develop some kind of a tool or database from it um, you're getting into quite an expense to do that. And you need more than just one, two, three, four, ten, fifteen firms. You know, you need hundreds, okay? My question is kind of a follow-up to Mauricio's. Um, I heard that the Transims model does not include freight data. Could you um, maybe comment, to tell me if this if that's accurate, and if it is, um, is there any work being done to include freight data in the future? Okay. Uh, the way you want to think of Transims, it's a skeletal tool. It provides all the hooks and places for an agency to put what they want into the modeling scheme. Okay. One of the things that you put in are the freight, is the freight movement. So as you probably are aware, Metro is involved in the development of the prototype system for transims. For the person trip tables, we are working with people to develop logical uh, algorithms, if you will, for that. What we'll also do is take our freight information from the work that we've been doing over the past five or six years, and that will be an input into it. So does, does Transims go in and have truck trip generation rates and all this kind of stuff? No, it doesn't. It just inputs uh, models from what your local um, agency has already produced. Great. Thank you very much.
<laughs> Those of you who are uh, students enrolled in the class, uh, give me your questions. I know a lot of you ask questions. Just do me a favor, write down.